It's, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jack Malone. I've known him for a very long time, when I was much skinnier, and he was about the same size. Uh, this bastard has not gotten bigger and fatter like I have. Um, so Jack is uh, a, a really interesting uh, colleague of ours. He has followed it, uh, a path different than some of your professors. So Jack started with us in graduate. So Jack started on the East Coast. Uh, doing a lot of cool ecology, subtitle ecology, estuarine work, etc. Came out to UCLA for graduate school, and that's when, when I met him, and that's when I screwed him up, and, uh, and all that kind of jazz. Uh, we did our PhDs together out at Catalina, and I would not have gotten through my PhD if it wasn't for my friend Jack. He, he uh, saw me at the low, low times when I thought the world was all against me, and <laughs> and people did stupid things to my research and things, and so, so I'm very thankful to have a friend like Jack. Um, I, I just simply delayed him getting his PhD. I, I, don't, know, I don't think I helped him out very much. But, uh, uh, so anyway, so he did that. He did all that great uh, subtitle ecology work. And then um, got more and more interested in some of the applied sides of things, and went and uh, after graduation worked for the Army Corps of Engineers, where he worked for several years, and he might touch on that in his presentation. And after working for, for, so he'd been in academia, government, and then most recently he's gone into the private sector uh, working for Anchor QEA, a consulting firm. He's going to tell us about some of their work that they've uh, done. But um, a really interesting cat, he knows all the different sides of things. He can speak to all these different places where some of you guys might be interested in working. So in addition to his presentation, afterwards I'm sure he's pr probably entertained some questions about you know, questions about career and, and, and career paths and stuff like that. Um, and uh, very happy to say that randomly, we, well not randomly, but you know, I ended up back in Ventura County, Jack ended up in Ventura County, Dr. Steele ended up in Ventura County, a bunch of my friends somehow magically came around this gravity well that's Ventura County. So I feel very lucky that people I've known for many decades are here and we have a wonderful resource base in Ventura County for looking at a lot of these coastal management things and a lot of the things you guys are talking about and have talked about in this class in law and policy and that kind of stuff um, are really, um, uh, Ventura County is an excellent exemplar of a lot of these issues that, we're, that you guys have been talking about. And so tonight, Jack is gonna talk about, whoa, what happened? That was good. I don't know. Uh, I don't know this mirroring is. went awry. What the heck is this? Good reminder, and then tell it like 24 hours. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, <laughs> that was cool. So anyway, so Jack's going to tell us about um, some sediment management issues, particularly around the Port Wainimi. You talk about things mm -hmm. other than that, or you focus on Port Wainimi? Focus on Port Wainimi. Okay, cool. So without further ado, Dr. Jack Malone. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So I didn't know this was going to be the last um, lecture that's not. I guess the last live The lecture. last so pers in-person lecture. It's kind of a, a high bar, and um, I, hopefully it'll be, it'll be kind of interesting. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a project that's kind of in our backyard, and I, I think Channel Islands, right, you guys have different partnerships with the mm -hmm. Port, mm -hmm. Port Wainimi. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So a specific project that uh, I was involved with on the... I guess at the very beginning when I was still working for the core, sort of on the government regulatory side, but mostly on the, uh, on the sort of another seat at the table as a, a technical consultant to the port. Um, so talk about the projects or nuts and bolts and then at different points, I'll, I'll try and touch on, you know, federal and state environmental laws and policies and, and things. So I'm at somewhat of a disadvantage in that I don't know anything that you guys have been learning this, <laughs> this whole term. Uh, so I, I know something about state and federal environmental law and policy, but I don't know what you've been talking about. So um, we'll keep it, I think, at a, at a level where we're all hopefully on the same page. Um, and I'll have questions for you guys so it's not, you know, not just me up here droning on for a long time. And then I'll try and get through it in case you guys have questions about like Sean said, any sort of career stuff, because I started out, um, I was in school, I was in school until I was 29. So went to college, worked for a year, went to graduate school, and the years kind of <laughs> went on, right? And, uh, You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So I, start, so I started graduate school um, 20 years ago. And so that's when I met Sean. So it's been a long time. Um, and then I was, I was at the core, so working as a regulator for the government 
for about five years, and then I've been a consultant for like eight years now, I think. So time's moving on. Um, but in general, so when I say I'm a consultant, I work for an environmental science and engineering company. We do a, a lot of stuff. We work for a lot of ports, so we focus on, um, in large part, contaminated sediments, waterfront kind of issues. So I don't work on projects like, you know, you guys are building this new building we're in, and there is all sorts of design and environmental investigations and, you know, regulatory process. I don't do that. I only work on stuff that's in the water, on the water, because that's sort of what I'm interested in, and that's kind of our niche. And so that's a whole set of, you know, laws and regulations and policies and stuff you have to deal with whenever you're in and around the water. So um, that's what I do. And I guess sort of in general, and this project's a good example, what we get paid to do is solve problems for people. Um, there's not really anything we do that's just to, to learn something or figure out how something works. If someone's going to be paying us to do it, it's, you know, because they need to know for a specific reason, whether they need to comply with um, you know, water quality laws, or, or total maximum daily load allocations, things like that. Um, whether in this case they have a problem with uh, contaminated sediment, that's keeping them from doing what they need to do with their operations and capital projects. So, so that's what I do. I get paid to solve problems. So um, you guys talk a lot about coastal resources, and you f I think most people would, would have, you know, beaches, wetlands, things like that in mind, uh, but also things like this. So big ports are actually really valuable resources along the coast, and there are provisions in, you know, things like Coastal Zone Management Act, um, state tidelands, you know, regulations that are all about commerce and you know fishing and access and things like that. So, you know, big ports like these are also coastal resources. Um, you may not, you know, think them that way to begin with, but there are a lot of management issues that go along with them. So I'm going to be talking specifically about Port Wainimi. Um, I don't know. I guess just as are you guys at all aware of the port at Port Wainimi? Yeah, someone. Have you ever been there? Yeah. You've been there? Inside the port? No, that's a J. <laughs> okay. Does that count? Outside? Yeah. That's <laughs> good. So you guys are generally aware. Um, it's, it's something, and the port grapples with this themselves. A, a lot of people in the county aren't really aware of, of the port and what they do. Um, it's not, you know, a giant port like LA and Long Beach, and you can't just go walk on there and see what they do, in part because of the naval base. So it's... Uh, it's a shared port. So there's the Oxnard Harbor District. They run the commercial side of things. And they're a special district. Um, you know, it's not run by the city port Wanimi or anything like that. There's the Army Corps of Engineers. They actually maintain a federal channel in there. And there's the Navy, so Naval Base Ventura County. Um, about half the port they use for military operations. Um, on this particular project, so Anchor, that's us, and we had a couple consultants helping us out on this. So just from looking at this slide with the, you know, the players we're talking about here, as far as, you know, big picture environmental laws and policies, what are some things that come to mind that you can, you can see? If we're, if we're thinking about a dredging project, what kind of, you know, big laws and policies would you be thinking about federal and state? Well, you'd have to do an environmental impact report and state impact. Right, so that's CEQA, so the California Environmental Quality Act, and in this case you have the Oxnard Harbor District. They're not a state agency, but they're a special district, so it's the same thing. So they're, you know, they're sort of the state action agency. Um, on the, you know, so you have the Corps of Engineers and the Navy, so they're federal agencies, so instead of CEQA you have NEPA, right? National Environmental Policy Act. So start thinking about those kind of questions as I go through and talk about the components, what sort of you know, laws and policies that maybe you guys have been talking about that are going to come into play here. 
So the port, these are a couple of pictures of the port just to kind of show you, um, you know, if you haven't been there, some aerials. Um, you have, so this, this is Wyandimi Beach and Port Wyandimi over there, and this is um, just past the Silver Strand. This is over here um, a little bit. And there's a couple of vessels, so the Willenius vessel up on, sort of on the top there, that's a car carrier, and then there are a couple, um, three smaller vessels. Those are uh, fruit ships. So Port Wenyme moves a ton of, ton of bananas. Um, and these figures are a little bit uh, outdated, but it's, it's billions of dollars in cargo that are going through the port every year just in commercial cargo. And that's uh, a lot of bananas to add up to <laughs> billions of dollars. It's a lot of cars, so they move a lot of cars in and out on those car carriers. Um, and they do some weird stuff that you might not think about, um, stuff that's hard to handle, that a containerized port like, so LA or Long Beach, what they do, they have massive ships come in that are stacked high with shipping containers, mostly coming from China, right? And they just take containers off, put them on trucks and drive them away. They don't really handle a lot of weird stuff that's a pain to deal with. So if you have um, like heavy equipment that needs special handling or maybe um, big windmill parts that are big and awkward to handle and take a lot of time, Wainimi does a lot of that stuff. Um, recently, I saw they had a bunch of automated equipment that's going to be used at the Port of Long Beach, but they couldn't unload it at the Port of Long Beach because the longshoremen would not unload it because this is equipment that's eventually going to be taking their jobs. So the <laughs> longshoremen at Wainini said, bring it on, you know, we'll, we'll take care of it. So you have weird stuff like that, that, you know, year in and year out adds up um, to, a, you know, a decent <laughs> business line. And you have Naval Base Ventura County as well. Um, that's just perennially one of the biggest employers in the county. And so they have a lot going on with dealing with the range, um, dealing with you know, vessels and everything they do. So Wainimi is you know, small compared to LA and Long Beach, but it's actually really important for the county. Um, I'll just go through a little history quickly. Uh, the port was you know, formed a long time ago, you know, back in the good old days with, with uh, you know, a wooden wharf and uh, things you know, when sugar beets were still, were still big big industry in Oxnard and Wainimi. Um, it was used a lot during the war, uh, like all of our ports out here. So an interesting thing, they, so they excavated this, this harbor. So it's actually not state tidelands. So that's another uh, sort of whole set of <coughs> laws and regulations and policies when you're dealing with tidelands that are held in trust for everyone in the state and if you want to do something with tidelands, there are all sorts of restrictions and, and issues you have to deal with. So the port itself is not tidelands. Uh, what else? Well, like I said, the Navy. Um, and this is a, a little bit of a cartoonish breakdown. You can see the, you know, the purple is sort of the commercial side. They have a couple terminals there, and then the Navy side is much bigger because um, they, they use it a lot for logistics, moving stuff in and out as needed. So some examples of some ships, if you haven't seen them, um, car carriers and brake bulk and specialties, that weird kind of pain to handle stuff I mentioned, and tons of bananas. <laughs> so the Navy, um, and their missions change over time. Uh, they do a lot of work supporting the range and stuff like that, and depending on what we have going on um, overseas, they, they uh, support the mission. So sediment, that's what sort of brought us to Port Wainimi and is kind of going to be a focus here. Um, so within the harbor, you have the federal channel that the Corps of Engineers is sort of managing, and then you have the berths, so where the ships actually tie up against the wharf. <laughs> that area, that's the responsibility of the Navy and of the harbor district. Over time, decades and decades, you know, a bunch of sediment has sort of built up and it was contaminated and so when I say the sediment's contaminated again it goes back so what does that mean there's all sorts of definitions for contaminants 
um, depending on the, the media you're talking about, you know, what's it in? Is it air? Is it water? Is it sediment? And are you talking about, you know, federal definitions, state definitions, whatever? So, for example, there are definitions for hazardous waste. So a certain concentration of a certain, you know, specific pollutant means it's hazardous waste, and then it has to be handled in a certain way. So in this case, when I say this sediment is contaminated, it's not, it doesn't reach that bar of being hazardous waste, but it's not something that you could dredge up and put on the beach, even though it's sandy, uh, because you'd have concerns about, you know, uh, human contact and things like that. So it, it needed some sort of special management. And the, the Harbor District and the Army Corps of Engineers, um, it's the second point here, they had been studying the possibility of deepening the, the port, so they deepen the approach channel where the vessels come in and deepen the berths, and um, you know, going through the congressional authorization process, and in order to sort of make their case that, hey, this is a good way to spend federal money and to spend you know, the local sponsor, the Harbor District's money to make this deeper, they kind of had to show that it pencils out. So if we spend you know, $10 million making it deeper, there's going to be $20 million of economic benefit or something like that, right? So that way you can convince Congress and everyone else this is, this is worth doing. Well, when they went out and sampled the sediment and found that it's not something they could just dig and put on the beach, all of a sudden that economic cost-benefit just goes south on you because if you, if you think, well, we'll just dig up all this, you know, 200,000 cubic meters of sediment and take it to a landfill or something, it's so prohibitively expensive that, there, that you'd never recoup the cost, so the project isn't going to happen. So that's, what, that's where they were. It just sort of stalled out. And as a result, no dredging happened. Um, you'd have situations where, like, the Navy would have to restrict the types of vessels that could call because on certain tides it wasn't uh, deep enough to get the clearance under the hull that they need. And, um, you know, if you're a skipper of a, uh, a Navy ship and you run aground, you're not going to be the skipper of a Navy ship anymore. You're done. I mean, that's, that's just it. Um, that was your, essentially your one job, and you, you failed. So, <laughs> so that's, that's a big problem. And for the commercial side, they'd have tenants that, you know, customers uh, that would come in. So one of the things they do is, is import liquid bulk fertilizer. So they have tankers that are coming in, and they're, you know, sort of square-shaped hulls, and they come in loaded as, as heavy as they can. And if they have to start playing around with the tides and, or worry about running aground, they have to not load the vessels as highly, as heavily, so it's not as efficient. So they're losing money, having over time, right, they have to run an extra trip or two, and that costs a lot of money. And so then they complain to the port and say, hey, maybe we're gonna have to go someplace else. So it became a real issue for operations and for finance. And the port's trying to compete with all these other ports, you know, all up and down the West Coast too. So it was a real issue. Um, and it all came down to this, you know, what are you going to do with this contaminated sediment? How are you going to manage it and, you know, allow this dredging to happen in a cost-effective way? What, the, what was the time frame on that? Or when did it start to become a problem? It was about 2000. So it was about the year <coughs> 2000. Um, the Corps and the Harbor District had sort of gone down, so they prepared a NEPA environmental assessment and a CEQA uh, initial study mitigate ne negative declaration, looking at the project, and they actually approved those documents and certified them. So they were kind of, you know, going down that path when it ground to a halt. Um, so in total, there's about, there was about 250,000 cubic meters of contaminated sediment, you know, mixed all throughout the port. Um, so we, so PAHs are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, so like oil and grease kind of stuff, PCBs, um, DBT pesticides, tri DBT is tributyl tin, so that was used in um, bottom paint, uh, so anti-fouling paint on vessels. Uh, it's since been phased out, but this sort of, you know, that sort of suite of contaminants you find anywhere. I mean, you'll find anywhere in any water. <laughs> um, 
any port here, you'll find DDT in any water in Southern California. Um, but, you know, so those were standard things. There wasn't anything especially scary. Um, and it, the sediment itself was, you know, pretty normal stuff to sand, silts, and clays. And it was kind of spread around. So you have these, these sort of red hot spots and along the berths there, kind of cartooned in. The dotted line is, you know, sort of the Corps of Engineers jurisdiction. So all three parties, the Corps, the Harbor District, and, and the Navy, had these issues. And each of them were sort of grappling on their own with how they were going to deal with it, um, it, you know, as their own little project. So like I said in the beginning, we, we work with sediment um, and we work with ports. And so we got involved and we were looking at these management alternatives. What can you do with the sediment? Landfill I mentioned, not a good option. It's really prohibitively expensive. And then you start running into these other issues um, like how many dump trucks does it take to haul 250,000 cubic meters of sediment? It takes a lot. And then they have to drive on the streets, and so they're putting out, you know, diesel particulate. So you start running into air quality issues, you run into traffic issues, safety issues, noise. You know, it's it's not a good option. Beneficial reuse. So when we say beneficial reuse, when we talk about sediment, um, that's just sort of using it for something else. So if you have nice clean sand. What people like to do is use it for beach nourishment. So Wainimi Beach is perennially eroded. So if you have good clean sand, you can put it on Wainimi Beach and you're not just dumping it, it's being used for a beneficial purpose. Um, if you have contaminated sediment, beneficial reuse becomes more difficult. Um, sometimes you can treat it, depending on the contaminants and the type of sediment, you could, um, you could add stuff to it to kind of lock up the contaminants and then maybe use it as construction fill you could, um, if you have a bunch of sand, maybe you could put it in these big sort of, um, they come hydrocyclones and separate out by, um, by specific gravity the sand from the silts and you take the dirty silts away and you use the clean sand for something good. Um, so we considered that. Uh, we considered an on-site <coughs> nearshore confined disposal facility. So that's sort of making new land. In this case, you'd fill some of the water, you know, sort of build a wall and put the dirty sediment behind it, but the port's already, you know, not that big to begin with, so they couldn't really give up any water. This, you know, fourth one has kind of been the, the go-to in Southern California for a very long time. So LA and Long Beach have done a few very, very big uh, capital improvement projects where they do um, create more land from water. And so ships are getting bigger and bigger, so they redo their terminals, they fill in some water, and they make fewer gigantically long terminals and more up, so backlands where they can stack all their containers and have trucks take them away. So when they're filling all that water, it's like a sort of discovery channel project, they need millions and millions of cubic yards of fill just to dump in the water behind a wall to make land. And that's what everyone has been you know, trying to do with all their contaminated sediment. Well, at the time the port, Port Wainimi was, was grappling with this issue, there wasn't any option of, at LA or Long Beach to do that. Um, Long Beach was embroiled in all sorts of litigation. Um, there was all, it was litigation about, mostly about air, so air quality, diesel particulate and that sort of stuff, and cancer risk in the community, because they're big terminal development projects um, if you're opposed to them, you know, there's all sorts of ways to try and, and fight them and, uh, you know, bring up technical points and they're getting a lot of traction with, you know, air quality because it's already bad enough in LA as it is. So port fills were not an option. Um, so one that we considered was confined aquatic disposal. And with, let's see, I think my next, yeah. So what that is, um, I'll show you some pictures. If you imagine the bottom of the harbor, you dig a big hole, a very big hole, and take that material and put it somewhere, and then you fill the hole with the contaminated sediment, and then you cap it with a bunch of clean sediment. That's 
confining it. It's aquatic because it's sort of in the, you know, in the bottom of the harbor. And you're not reusing it for something great. You're just getting rid of it. So it's disposal rather rather than beneficial use. And this is something that's been done on the East Coast and in Europe a lot more than on the West Coast, in part because they've been dealing with these issues for a lot longer than we have out here, right? You know, there's been a lot of industry in other parts of the world for longer than here, and you know, they've encountered these problems earlier. So the reason we thought that was kind of a clever approach is, um, you know, sort of all these reasons. It, it, it made sense because it was sort of self-contained. We could design it to take care of the Navy sediment, the Corps of Engineers sediment, and the Harbor District sediment. Um, it, it was sort of a complete project on its own, um, the way we could design it to sort of um, take care of, like I said, all the sort of three players. Um, it was on site, so you don't have all those truck trips and air you know, quality impacts and traffic that I, I mentioned. Um, if we did it right, then the harbor deepening could advance because we'd take care of that problem with the contaminated sediment. Um, and I say, you know, it provided environmental protection. It may not seem, just from my description, it may sound very environmentally unprotective, right? I mean, you dig a big hole and you put <laughs> contaminated stuff in it and you cover it up. How is that environmentally protective? And that's what lots of people, you know, said. And, you know, that was one of the issues, especially in California, with proposing projects like that. Um, so you have to demonstrate that it's, it really is environmentally protective. Um, and I said it provides local beach nourishment, so I'll get to uh, how that happened as well. So um, here's how it worked. This is an aerial of the harbor. So the, the blue square there, that's where this, this confined aquatic disposal facility was built. And just to help explain, so this is sort of a cross section, like a cartoon cross section of the hole that I described. And so these are elevations. Uh, and so MLLW is mean lower low water. So it's just a vertical tidal datum. And so the bottom of the hole was at minus 85 feet mean lower low water. So it's pretty, it's pretty far down. It's like I said, it's, it is a big hole. And it's, uh, I can't remember the dimensions. I mean, it's 100 something meters square. So it's, it's a big hole in the harbor. The, one of the hard things about dredging is you can't really see, right? So it still looks the same. You got to look at the site. <laughs> well, there's the water. It still looks the same before and after. So, um, so pictures are kind of difficult. <laughs> but this is kind of the concept. So dig the big hole. We we did a bunch of sampling. So we advanced cores down past here. So these were you know sediment cores that were super super long, and analyzed the sediment chemistry. So we'd done this all throughout the entire harbor. So we knew where the bad areas were, where the clean areas were. And this particular spot, so it's kind of in the middle, right, in the middle of the, this is the turning basin, so when ships come in here, they have to, they're helped by tugs and they turn around and go to the wharves. So this surface here gets blasted by tugboats, by the, um, a lot by the Navy, so the Navy ships come on here and then, then they pull away from the wharf and then this is really pretty narrow for, for Navy ships that are themselves quite narrow. So they really get on it when they come out of here. And so this area is scoured. So there wasn't a layer of surface contamination there. And then when you go down this deep, this is well below any depth that's ever been exposed in the port. So this was all clean sand. When we were pulling up these cores, it looked just like if you went out to Wainimi Beach and you know pulled up a bucket of sand. So digging this hole, we were able to actually pump that right to the beach, which was really nice because the beach was completely eroded. Um, you couldn't even walk on most of it. Um, what year was that? 2009. So this is about 2009 that we're doing this. So sort of here's what we did. This is digging the hole. So we dig that big hole and pump the sand to Wainimi Beach to build up the beach. Like in this aerial here, you can see the water is up against the, uh, the revetment, so there was no real beach there. 
So this is the dredge. I don't know. Hopefully you guys like dredge. Who doesn't like dredges? So this is, <laughs> this is a, a pretty big dredge. And this is the one that you'll see pretty soon. It's the one that does um, Channel Islands. So you see it outside Channel Islands Harbor. And it'll pump to the beaches along there. It'll pump to sometimes Silver Strand, Wainimi Beach. Um, so it's a big hydraulic cutter head suction dredge. So that's the cutter head part of it. So it's, it has these teeth that they can replace, and it spins, and it's sort of you know like a snout. They stick it down in the sediment. It spins. They have massive pumps that, as this thing's spinning, it's sort of agitating the sand and breaking it up, and it sucks it all out, and you know goes through pipelines and then discharges. And it, it you know you turn it on and it works and just keeps keeps pumping away. So. The slurry that it's pumping out is mostly water. It's you know maybe 10% sand, so it's it's a bunch of water you'll see, and that's like I said the snout is down. This is the pipe that's coming up, and it's going to be pumped out to Wendy Beach, which is over there. So this is what the the end of the pipe looks like. <laughs> so you know they run the pipe out on the beach, the slurry comes out, um, and it's a legitimate concern. Too, when when we're, you know, looking at projects like this, people say, well, what about you know wildlife and sensitive species and, and things like that, and you know, that's a valid concern. But one of the reasons I like this picture is, you know, the the gulls, obviously don't mind, and so they're waiting around, they're eating you know invertebrates and stuff that's coming out. Um, and you can see the port in the background. So those tanks are some of the tanks for. Um, the liquid bulk fertilizer. So they dug out the hole, and then the next step was um, dredging all the contaminated sediment and then putting in the hole. And we sort of sequenced this to put the worst stuff into the hole first. Do you have a question? How long did it take to dig out the hole? That's a good. It took months. So. Yeah, month and a half. Yeah, mid-December to the end of January. So, um, and that's working 24-7. So when, so with that, with that dredge, they just work around the clock, and they have different shifts come and go, but they, they don't like to turn it off. Um, so now you have the whole, there's time to dredge the contaminated sediment, and that's sort of a different process. So, the, so that big <coughs> hydraulic dredge that you know, dug the hole isn't really appropriate for dealing with contaminated sediment and for working up against the wharves and things like that. You have to be a little more careful. So they use some different equipment, something like this you may have seen. So it's, it's sort of just like, it's a big crane. So it's a barge uh, with a sort of a big crane on it. And this is a clamshell, so it's like a big scoop. And this is a split hole barge. So you can see here it, it's kind of high up in the water. It's empty at this point. And so they just drop the clamshell down, take a scoop, put it in the barge, and they just repeat for over and over all day. And when the barge is filled up, oh, so there you go, there's a the clamshell. So um, that's what these guys are looking at, just, you know, Scooping, scooping into the barge hour after hour. And so this is sort of looking down once it's filled up. Even with the clamshell where you're, you're scooping up, you know, a big, um, a big bunch of sediment and it's, it's not the same thing as the hydraulic dredge where you're agitating it and using suction. There's still a lot of water, uh, but it's nowhere near the amount of water that you'd have in the, with the hydraulic operation. So, then they would take the scow and position it over the hole, over the uh, confined aquatic disposal cell, and the barge would open up. So it sort of splits in the middle, and then the sediment <coughs> dumps out like that. So that's, um, that's looking at it. It's you know, pretty neat to see. And so then all this contaminated sediment drops down through the water into the hole. Um, 
and this pic, so I took this picture, and I, that's because I was actually out in a boat, and I was taking water samples while they were, you know, dropping the sediment. Because this is another thing where you might say, well, wait a second, how does that make any sense at all? You have contaminated sediment, and you're going to dig it up, and you're trying to be careful with it, and then you put it in this thing, and you just open it and drop it through the water column. That sounds like a terrible idea. You know, how does that work? Isn't that making things worse? Um, and then again, if you think about the, uh, you know, all the sorts of laws that might pertain to water quality, right? You're using this discharging material. So um, again, there was a lot of monitoring that had to be done in order to get approval from the regulatory agencies. Uh, there's a lot of modeling, so water quality modeling and dispersion modeling. So lots of people much smarter than I am, you know, sitting at computers running models where they're using, you know, the sediment information and the chemical concentrations and all this, you know, all this stuff and figuring out how much of the chemicals in the sediment are going to actually disperse into the water column as it's dropping down. Um, so all of that sort of you know technical work was was done sort of in the design phase, so we could talk to the agencies and, and explain like to the water board. Yes, it's a good idea to drop this stuff you know through the water column into this hole, and you know it's not going to cause problems. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of behind the scenes work there. So once all the contaminated sediment is is in the hole, we have the clean material on the beach already. Then there was, you know, a good portion of the area, so, so these more open areas that are away from the wharves where the ships sit, that sediment was essentially clean. So you could have dredged that and put it on the beach. It's, it's just sort of sandy material. So that became the cap that's on top of the uh, dirty stuff. And so that was dredged with just, just an, you know, a third type of dredge. Um, hopefully you guys are interested in dredges. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a hopper dredge. It's sort of like a vacuum cleaner where it, you know, sort of has the vacuum <coughs> head down there and it sucks up the sediment and pumps it into its own hopper and then it goes and, and discharges it. So that's a clean, a clean sand layer that's over the top. And that was actually uh, about 10 feet thick. So that's a lot of material. Um, you remember I mentioned the, the Navy ships, when they go out of the harbor, they, they go out pretty fast. Um, so because of that, when we were looking at the bathymetry, you could actually see scour. So there was a, there was a strip, um, you know, sort of like they were peeling out, going away from the dock. And we, we thought, well, we've just, you know, buried this contaminated sediment, we've capped it with nice clean material, how are we going to protect it from just getting all um, scoured? And so we needed to put some armor on top of it. So the stone is more resistive, more resistant to, you know, scour than just sand. So this is actually from Catalina, this stone. So it's, it's kind of strange to think about. They they slowly make Catalina smaller. There's quarries out there still. <laughs> and load it onto barges like this, and then they barge it all the way from Catalina to here, or wherever, and then they would push it off. So looking at this, it seems really uh, pretty primitive, but they, <laughs> they did a really good job. So they actually, there were very um, detailed specifications on exactly where the armor needed to be and how thick. And they did a great job of positioning it, um, you know, just kind of pushing it off. Now, you guys have been thinking a lot about like environmental policies and laws and stuff like Clean Water Act and NEPA and SEPA and all that, right? Um, and that's mostly what I think about too. But on all these projects, there's also a whole lot of other laws about not killing people. <laughs> and <laughs> And those, so, so health and safety. So health and safety is a huge thing on any, you know, uh, construction project, what, you know, building a house or doing this kind of work. And it's, there's a lot of it that, that's pretty dangerous, right? So you're working on the water and um, like my company is very, very, any company that wants to stay in business has to be very 
very conscientious about health and safety. And the bigger the company, so we work for you know, some really big uh, industrial um, clients like, um, like a GE, right? Or a, um, if you work for a, uh, like a gas company or something, they are so much more focused on health and safety stuff than you can ever man imagine. It still surprises me the more and more they they, they get serious about it every single year because it's such a liability to them if something happens, if someone gets hurt, that they just have, have no tolerance. So in watching this, so there's a guy on a barge in the water, you know, running this little, this little bulldozer around. There's not really, so it's not like there's a, a rail here <laughs> or something. <laughs> and granted, it's in the harbor, but it's, it's in the water, so things move around a little bit. So that was kind of a, it was kind of something that gave us pause, and we, we talked to the contractor a lot about it, and it was something they were, they were aware of, and, but still it made us nervous. You know, even though it's, you know, that contractor's not working for me, it's not my company. But we were out there when they were finishing up this phase, and they had all these folks from the port, they had some, um, state representatives, because it was the end of the project, they were having this big ceremony saying, oh, it's successful, what a great job, everyone, this is, this is fantastic. And they were having a little ceremony out there. And so I was there, you know, wearing nice clothes and listening. And in the background, behind where all these folks were standing, luckily they had their backs turned, I'm watching as the crane is lifting that bulldozer with the operator inside it <laughs> from the deck of one barge over water to the other barge and the, the guy is sitting in the bulldozer right there you know with his hard hat on and his life jacket and my eyes are like this like what you know I, and, and it's not even I'm not like a you know super health and safety guy it's not what I do I'm not a construction worker, but even I knew that that just was not something that should ever, <laughs> ever have been done. And so, you know, some of the guys I worked with were next to me, and I kind of look over, and they're doing the same thing, staring as this guy is being placed down there. And, you know, luckily, you know, nothing bad happened, but it was one of those things that, you know, in hindsight, they just, sh they should not have done. You know, they should not have been working that way. Um, I don't and see the problem with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he had his PFD on. So yeah, so he had a life jacket, right? Right. All right. So now you guys have some understanding of the project, that, you know, the, the, the players and what was going on. Um, there are all sorts of engineering design stuff that, you know, I can talk about a little bit if you're interested, but you're probably more focused on this sort of stuff, the, the environmental side of things. So. We talked about CEQA and NEPA. So we have, you know, this, the Harbor District's a state agency, or special district, so they're sort of a state agency. You have the Corps of Engineers and the Navy. You know, they're both federal agencies. So you have to comply with both CEQA <coughs> and NEPA. And what we did in this case is we did a joint document. So instead of, you know, sort of both parties working sort of independently, we work to um, make a joint document. So in this case, um, they didn't need to prepare an EIR or an EIS. They prepared um, an environmental assessment, so that's sort of a, a next tier down, and they prepared a mitigated negative declaration for CEQA. So I don't know the level that you guys talked about this stuff, but. So why, why would you, for NEPA, why would you prepare an environmental assessment rather than environmental impact statement? And tell me if you, like, this isn't stuff that you've... Uh, is it because it's a federally funded project and it's exempt from having to do any of that? Yeah, so it's, um, so if we're just talking about NEPA, um, you're right, so it's, it's federal agencies, the Corps and the Navy, and so you have to comply with NEPA, but they don't worry about CEQA. Yeah. Um, so for NEPA, if, if you are analyzing a project and you find that there will be 
potentially significant impacts to water quality or air quality or traffic or whatever it might be, uh, archaeological resources, cultural resources, if you're digging stuff up, um, and like with the pipeline, right? So, so like with the Dakota Access Pipeline, the Corps of Engineers is issuing permits for a bunch of crossings of streams and stuff. So they prepared some sort of NEPA document and they analyzed all sorts of stuff and, and, and you know, had to comply with cultural resource laws and stuff like that. Um, so in this case, we didn't have that, but we had, you know, Endangered Species Act. So you could ask a question about that. Well, what about birds? Are there least terns or western snowy plover or something that use the beach and you're going to be spewing all the sand out there? Um, water quality. So there are all, all those sorts of things. In, in doing the analysis, we were able to build in features to the project or, or mitigation measures to reduce those impacts. So there weren't going to be significant impacts. There would be less than significant impacts. And so if you have less than significant impacts, you can prepare an environmental assessment and a finding of no significant impact instead of having to prepare an environmental impact statement, which is sort of a higher, uh, higher tier analysis and, and more public involvement and, and a sort of more rigorous process. And so the same thing with, with CEQA. Now, um, one thing that you'll find sometimes is even if there's a project that is legitimately like pretty innocuous and won't result in significant impacts, you may still want to go ahead and prepare a more rigorous document. So we're working, for example, for the Park Service right now on a project to rebuild the pier at Scorpion Anchorage. If you've ever, ever been out there, there was, it, was a, it was an old rail car that's all rusty and not very nice. And they're going to be, it's shot. So they're building a new pier. Isn't it done now? I thought it was supposed to be done by now. <laughs> it was. It takes a little, the, the federal government is. Well, when I asked last month, they said it would be done by now. So there's a temporary <clears throat> pier that they just put on. So they took out the rail car and put a aluminum gangway. But the temporary is in now? Yes. Well, really? as of this week, it should be in. <laughs> Excellent. So that, that's, what the, that's what they just told us. So, <laughs> um, so anyway. It's so granted. It, it's a national park and marine sanctuary and all this sort of stuff. Um, so and and there are cultural resources. There are all sorts of reasons why you know any project out there is really sensitive. But building a new pier there, and I'm not talking about the temporary one, but the the actual new pier. It's really not that big a deal in, in terms of potential impacts. But the Park <coughs> Service prepared an environmental impact statement just to be extra conservative so they could say, look, you know, even though we think there, there really aren't going to be that many impacts, they're not going to be significant, we explain all the analysis, we're going to prepare this environmental impact statement instead of an environmental assessment. We're going to have a more robust you know, public involvement process, just a more rigorous assessment. Um, there are also sort of legal reasons if you prepare an EIS, it's, it's harder to challenge and if you prepare an environmental assessment, they just want to be careful, so they prepare an EIS. And so a lot of approaches to CEQA and NEPA are sort of a legal strategy, not necessarily um, you know, based on technical analysis, because people just want to be protected. Like, look, I'm gonna just you know, do the more rigorous one, because I want to have that protection in case someone opposes the project and wants to challenge it. Do they also do it just to save time? Because then, you know, people can be like, well, you know, you did the assessment, but we actually want you to do this now. And then yep. it's like another however long. Yep, exactly, exactly. So it's easier just to do, um, just to sort of hit that higher bar first than, you know, kind of trying you know, try and go with something, you know, a, a, a little easier first and then have to redo it. So that's all part of the sort of the legal strategy of, of doing it. So for the Wainimi project, um, in truth, people didn't really care that much what went on in the port. Uh, it's not as high profile as something like LA or Long Beach. Um, not as many people live right there. There's the naval base, so it's sort of insulated a little bit. 
Um, and there was a lot of outreach in advance too, to the agencies, to Surfrider, to Heal the Bay and things like that, just to you know, explain the project to them, get their feedback up front, and then build their concerns into the project. So if you can go and meet with you know, folks, all these different stakeholders who, who may be opposed to the project or may just have something to add that you don't know, you go and do that at the beginning and then you have a much stronger document um, so the analysis is technically stronger because you know stuff you didn't know before and people are less likely to try and sue you if you at least listen to them and they you know, know that, hey, you know, we were able to express our concerns, maybe some were addressed, maybe not all of them, but it was at least sort of a fair process. So, um, so that was sort of a strategic, um, a strategic approach. Um, so we talk about CEQA and NEPA. So Clean Water Act, right? You're, you're discharging a bunch of material, as the Corps would say, you're discharging you know, dredged or fill material into the waters of the United States. So there's Clean Water Act. So what other you know, federal and state, you know, just quickly, regulations you know, do you think you'd have to deal with for a project like this? Nothing. <laughs> so there's the Endangered Species Act and the state equivalent of the Endangered Species Act. In this case, it wasn't really that big a deal, um, given the species and the location. What about, so I know you guys have probably talked a lot about um, Coastal, Coastal Zone Management Act, California Coastal Act, presumably. So that's always, you know, a big deal. Um, air, so there's all sorts of requirements for um, emissions, and so that was actually, you know, something we had to think about. We have folks who model, you, you know, what are the, what are the emissions going to be from these massive pieces of equipment, and, you know, are they going to violate standards from the Air Pollution Control District, things like that. Mm -hmm. And is that, that district is, it's a regional thing, right? It's not necessarily a, well, it's state-run, but it's regional in scale? Right. Okay. Yep. So there are there are different mm -hmm. offices, and sort of the same thing for the water too. There's state water board. There's regional boards. Air pollution control districts. The states <coughs> divided into different sort of um, uh, jurisdictional areas and and boards that go along or districts that go along with managing them, mm -hmm. and each one sort of has its own um, thresholds for things. So um, there's that. I just there was something else that I thought was actually going to be interesting, but of course I've forgotten it. Coastal zone management. Yeah, so I mentioned coastal management. Here. Uh, so how often do you guys of the project you guys do? How often do you in California? How often do you do joint NEPA CEQA reports? Is that a sort of common thing? Is that rare? It's it's not uncommon. Um, so we had a similar project. For, so they're replacing a pier in San Diego for the Navy. Um, and so the Navy and UCSD. So again, it was sort of a shared facility. So it was the same thing, federal and state. So we did a, a joint document with them. Um, the ports, like LA and Long Beach, will do that a lot with the Corps of Engineers when you're, um, again, you have the sort of state and the federal component. So. I, I will say in honesty, that sounds very good, right? So doing a joint document sounds very good and efficient. It's a huge pain because both parties want it to look like what they want it to look like. They don't want it to also, like the federal agencies don't want it to also look like a CEQA document. They want it to look like their, their normal federal document. And especially for projects like, you know, sort of bigger projects, you have legal review. And so then the attorneys say, well, this doesn't look like what our normal template is supposed to look like. So I actually am not sure that in the end it helps. I think sometimes it's just a wash um, to do a joint rather than separate ones, but, um, but it sounds good. And, and in <laughs> theory, it can, be, it can be more efficient. So here, these are just some of the, where I sort of broke down some of the project components, right? So 
you know, just digging the hole and putting sand on the beach, you're dealing with, you know, state and federal and, you know, the Clean Water Act as well. Um, when it came to the permits from the agencies, um, we had both, you know, both the Navy and the Harbor District sort of sign on, partly for political reasons. Um, and in, in, so for one example, the Navy, very big, you know, federal entity, they have more clout sort of pushing projects through with the agencies than someone like the Harbor District that's, you know, kind of a small state agency. So it can be helpful politically to, to have that. And if, so if you need to go to a Coastal Commission hearing and talk about your project and present it and ask the commissioners to approve it, if you have the base commander in his dress uniform talking about how valuable it is for you know, his mission, that looks a lot better than me standing there in my suit, you know, some consultant being paid to be there talking about the project. So um, that was sort of a little, a, a little um, strategy we worked in there. So this is some of the other, um, I don't know if you guys are really that interested in design stuff. So how, we have 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. um, I think I've probably inflicted enough dredging <laughs> on you guys <laughs> for now. I mean, if you're really interested, I can talk about some of these considerations. I sort of touched on them. Can you talk about the bioturbation real quick before you go on? Bioturbation. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. the, um, yeah, so do you guys know, so we were talking about the cap. That's the clean material on top of the dirty. And, um, you know, we did a bunch of modeling to, you know, figure out if it would work. And one of the things we had to take into account was bioturbation. So do you guys know what that means in this context? Life digging in the sediment. Yep. So like ghost shrimp and stuff like that. So, you know, largely invertebrates that'll, you know, dig around. And with the cap being 10 feet thick, it wasn't really a problem. Um, it was just something we had to address, you know, again, to, to make everyone feel comfortable with the project. There were far bigger issues um, with, the, with the cap design, um, like scour, so we modeled, you know, the, the, the Navy destroyers digging it up. Um, just sort of chemical flux. So it turns out if you dig down deep enough there in the port or anywhere in the plane there, um, you can encounter uh, art artisanal conditions. So the flow, there's flow of water coming up, which is not what you want if you have a hole full of dirty sediment that you want to stay there. So we actually had to do some modeling um, for that to sort of look at, you know, how fast is this, is this coming up? How mobile are the contaminants? So some kind of contaminants are, are tightly stuck to sediment and they don't mobilize into water and come up very easily. Others mobilize much more readily. Um, and so we had to sort of figure out, well, if, it's, if contaminants are gonna be diffusing up through the cap, how fast is that happening? And you know, if the cap is super thick, it takes longer. And so we figured out, you know, again, some of these folks much smarter than I am figured out that it'll, for the most mobile stuff, it'll take thousands of years um, to get through, assuming, assuming nothing happens to the cap. Um, yeah, so this is some of the groundwater stuff we talked about. The predicted breakthrough greater than 8,000 years. Um, I won't. So some people find this to be the most interesting part, and in actually making the project happen, this was the most difficult part, because the technical stuff, you can sort of work through, like, you have really smart engineers, you can work through technical problems, and, and you can work with the agencies to get agreement, but dealing with the Navy and the Harbor District and the Corps, they have all these legal constraints that aren't environmentally related necessarily, but are like, contract and budget related and all of that stuff was really tough so we had to work with work with all of them to figure out who can pay for what based on their budgets and their timelines and their their you know legal requirements 
And so that was really a, you know, a, a big issue. Um, so the important thing here is, so this was completed in 2009, and we've been monitoring it ever since. So when you dig one of these holes and fill it up with sediment and cover it, the agencies want to see that you don't, you're not just forgetting about it, so you have to monitor it and manage it. And so there's a, there's a plan that's developed to manage the you know, facility, and that required annual monitoring each year. And the specifics vary by year. I think, yeah, here we go. So now we have five years of monitoring. So every year there's a hydrographic survey, so it's a bathymetric survey, where you're just looking at elevations to figure out what's going on. Um, periodically we go out and, and advance cores down through the cap, and then we, we take those cores and divide them up and take little subsamples and sample the sediment and then the water in between and look at the chemical concentrations to, to verify whether our models and predictions about stuff being contained and not mobilizing are actually true. So we look at that, um, and that's the sediment pour water. So, so far, everything's fine. So the, the, the cap isn't squishing too much, nothing's moving through. Mm -hmm. uh, was this uh, sort of adaptively managed where there's alternatives uh, set forth that you could use to mitigate any seepage or anything like that? How, if you find in your monitoring results like higher concentrations of, of chemicals higher in the, in the sediment column than you'd like, was there anything adaptive about that at all? Or was it just kind of like making sure it's not happening and that's it? There's not too much you can do. Yeah. So, that <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was um, that was a big uh, that was a big question, and that was why there's all all this sort of modeling and engineering that went into it to convince everyone that the likelihood of something bad happening is very small, because everyone agreed. Well, once you do this, it's kind of there. So it's. It's tough, mm -hmm. and that's also part of the rationale for the cap being as thick as it is. So, in a lot of, with a lot of things, similar things in other parts of the country or the world where they've done this a lot longer, the, you might have a cap that's two feet thick. And, you know, granted, we have seismic activity in California, so things do move around. Um, but that was just our part of it too, where we said, look, ten feet of sand is is a ton of sand that's really really conservative and you know we think it'll be fine and even if now the port is moving ahead with their dredging project you know the top of the the cap here is below it's already below deeper than they want to dredge so oh, yeah. even if they make it deeper and if you have bigger ships in it's still not going to be affected um, but that's a good question there there's not a whole <laughs> lot of stuff you could do I mean you could conceivably um, you know, dredge dredge it up if material is coming up, and replace it with a new cap, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, keep doing that. Um, that would be really expensive, and one of those things where you'd have to think long and hard about whether the potential uh, impacts associated with that are actually worse, worse yeah. than what you're seeing. Um, but but what, what what would happen if, um, let's say, you go out next year and you monitor and you find that the pollutant elevations, the, pol the pollution is elevated in the sediments, uh, what, would you guys be on the hook or would, would the um, Harbor District and those guys be on the hook? The, yeah, the Harbor District um, and the Navy would, would be on. So they have agreements for the <coughs> long-term management. And they're actually, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff going on too. So, so the Harbor is actually uh, listed as an impaired water body for a couple uh, contaminants, so that's a whole other regulatory program that's going on. The Navy has done a bunch of sampling of surface sediments out there as part of that compliance program. Um, and they have their whole, uh, you know, base, you know, remediation program that they're, mo um, uh, they're implementing that includes the harbor. So there's a lot of other stuff going on. Um, but, th I mean, that would be tough, honestly. That would be tough to figure out what to do. Um, but it wouldn't be you guys failed. It would be it's back yeah, on. Yeah, it would it's be back we on failed. Them. No, no. But I mean, but I mean, they wouldn't. You guys wouldn't be. 
your insurance wouldn't be paying. No. Those guys would be paying. Yeah. You wouldn't get hired again, but. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I. It would be hard to think that someone would sue because what they would, we would get a call that said you need to get us out of this. So we. <laughs> So, so new budget. <laughs> yeah, it would have to be a pretty lean budget though, since we designed it in the first place. But um, yeah, that would that would be tough. Now, if you remember, I said you know this stuff isn't. When I said it's contaminated, it's dirty. That means it's not suitable to just put on the beach. None of it was hazardous waste. You know, it wouldn't have to go to a special landfill. So, and the way it was phased, the. Mo highest concentrations were at the bottom, and then as you got sort of further up, yeah, you couldn't put it on the beach, but it's not really much worse than just sort of ambient. So, so there's a lot of that design that went into it. So anything that's sort of toward the top is not super bad. Um, but yeah, hopefully I'll be retired before anything <laughs> weird happens. And so the deepening, they're actually moving forward with that right now. Um, this is just kind of saying how, how smart we are and great. <laughs> um, and work together with everyone. So, yeah. So that's the project. I know there's, um, that was a lot of dredging to throw at you at the end of the day. Um, and if you have any questions about that, I'd certainly answer them. Or if you have questions just more about being a consultant, you know, or what I, what I do, or you know, what options might be with government or consultant. I'm happy. Questions. Uh, oftentimes, in uh, a couple of students and I are in environmental land use and planning course, mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes the by the, the people that are doing the environmental impact statement or the people that are developing the environmentalists or people that are monitoring the watchdogs are sort of demonized, I guess, and then vice versa. But it seems like, at the, be at the beginning of the presentation, it seems like there is sort of a collaborative discussion about it between, like you said, Surf Rider, Hill Bay, um, but, and then you kind of went back, took a step back and said that it's not really, like, considering all those before you write your DIR, EIS, it's not, as effective when you kind of watches out at the end? Is that what you meant by that? Or? Oh, no, no, sorry. Um, I, I, when I said um, I wasn't sure how effective a joint document, so instead of writing one, a, a NEPA document and then a CEQA document, writing one that covers all the bases mm -hmm. for both. Okay, not, um, not necessarily the, the, the parts that make up, the, well, the parts that make up the plan to, to go move forward. Right, okay. but that, that strategic approach of you know, engaging the, the stakeholders and, you know, folks who are interested, um, the environmental groups, whoever it might be, that is super effective and more, I mean, it, it's, it's what you have to do. Um, it, I think it's the right thing to do, but also just from a practical standpoint, if you don't do that in the, you know, in, in the first place, you're going to wind up being, you know, sort of at loggerheads further down the, the road. And what I found is, you may not always agree, like with Heal the Bay, in, in this particular case, we talked to them a bunch. They're engaged in sediment management you know, stuff in Southern California with, and, and sort of have, have a seat at the table along with some of the agencies just because they're such a big um, advocacy group and they represent so many people. They, we, we get to a point where maybe they don't agree philosophically with us and that's okay, but we've talked to them and heard their concerns, they've heard whatever technical approach we have, and they'll say, you know, okay, that's fine, you've studied it, you've considered our concerns, we don't agree philosophically, but we're good. Or we're at least not gonna sue you. <laughs> Which is good enough. <laughs> Other questions? What was your part in the project? Like, what did, like, were you just, like, part of the research team that was, like, saying, like, oh, we should p start putting the contaminants on the, like, the worst of it at the bottom? Or yeah, so that's a good question. So, uh, so like Sean said, I'm a biologist, a marine biologist, and work for the Corps, so I sort of know <coughs> the environmental process. So on this project, um, 
in the beginning stages, so I dealt with all the agencies, all the permitting, uh, the CEQA NEPA documents. I sort of managed all those, wrote, you know, bunches of it myself. Um, you know, met with all the folks and all the stakeholders and things like that. Um, and then when the project was actually going to construction, there was all sorts of monitoring and reporting. So environmental, like water quality stuff. So I was actually, because um, I live in Ventura, so I was actually there and taking these pictures and stuff like that. So I was sort of doing the field stuff too, um, helping out with some of the, um, just managing the construction. So working with the contractor, keeping an eye on the contractor, making sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. So if they're supposed to have silk curtains around their operation, if they're supposed to be, you know, doing things in a certain way, you know, I'm there to keep an eye on them. So it was sort of nice, um, and now I've been involved in, in the monitoring since then. So being out, collecting samples, looking at them and stuff like that. And so um, another thing I do is make sure that whatever the engineers are designing and working on, I can actually get approved by the agencies and aren't going to, you know, be in violation of any laws or regulations or things like that. So, um, so I learned a little bit about engineering. They learned a little bit about, you know, environmental regulations and policies. And <coughs> together we come up with something that actually, you know, can be built and approved. <coughs> Anything else? Any other questions you guys are wondering about? Great. We'll hang out for a minute or two, and uh, if you guys want to ask Jack a question up front, you can do that. And let's thank him. That was, great. That was a great talk. Thanks, Jack.